Leaders, does this sound familiar? You're overwhelmed. You're a self-professed control freak. Maybe you're a perfectionist or maybe some of my team, they just don't get it. And if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. It's faster if I just do it. If that's you, listen up. In this episode, I will give you two secrets to delegate effectively so you can move from having to micromanage to being the strategic leader that you are meant to be. I'm Daryl Black, and I help senior leaders make a positive impact in their personal and professional lives. I get it. I totally get it. You tell yourself BS stories that it's too slow to delegate or hand off work or no one can do it as well as you. Or if you want something done right, like I said, you got to do it yourself. I see this a lot, especially in folks that move from a doer, a, a high performer that maybe doesn't have direct reports to needing to be more strategic in your leadership and even more so a leader of leaders moving from that task oriented individual where you have a to-do list and you just get her done and you're not having to deal with people and communication, all these other challenges that comes with being a leader and a senior leader and moving from that to that strategic view to make sure that you're in alignment at the strategic level, the, the corporate vision, the values, the policies, making sure that there's very clear alignment between that strategic level and the tactical, all the things that as a leader, you need to make sure get done. When, when you were just doing the job, you didn't have to really worry about. So delegation, you've probably heard the term before, but maybe you're still holding on a little bit and you have some challenges with regard to delegating. But here's the thing. I would suspect that you're not a hoarder, right? You're not a hoarder like we see on TV and no judgment, but if you're not a hoarder at home, if you're not holding on to knickknacks from when you were eight all the way through to current uh, state, then why are you hoarding work? Because that's what you're doing. So why should you delegate more? I'll give you five reasons. There's a lot more, but five of the ones that maybe you can really resonate. Maybe one will hit you pretty hard. Maybe all five. I don't know. The first reason that you should delegate more is you don't scale well. You are one individual. You can't be all places at all times, particularly in a remote or hybrid workforce. And not even remote because of what we've been through in the last few years, but nowadays workplaces are so distributed. Industry is now global where you are managing folks in so many different time zones, so many different locations. And it can be a real challenge. So you simply can't be everywhere. You can't scale well. The second reason you should delegate more is you are a lid. I've done previous episodes on this concept of leader is a lid. Your team will rarely, if ever, rise above your own level of competence, confidence, and beliefs. So you are a lid. And so the third reason which is a good segue from number two is you're stifling the team's growth and selfishly it's in your best interest to ensure that they grow and they become more independent workers and team members, the high performers, especially they want to grow. They want to be challenged, but if you're hoarding all of the work, you are actually depriving them of opportunities to learn and to grow and to be challenged. And guess what? High performers, will look elsewhere for that challenge, for that fulfillment, for that growth. The fourth reason you should delegate is that it shows trust and respect. Respect influence is one of the strongest influences that we have as leaders. So by delegating, you're actually telling somebody that you trust them and that by definition or by association, you respect them. You respect their abilities. You respect their ethic. You respect their uh, determination or their commitment to get the job done. The fifth reason is in the long run, it becomes real fast, much faster. You become much more agile as a team and as a leader if you invest in the front end. So those five reasons, you don't scale well, you are a leader, and a lid. So the team will rarely, if ever, exceed past your own limits and beliefs. The third reason is you're stifling the team's growth and selfishly, 
you're actually causing more work for yourself by not having independent workers. And from the team perspective, they really want to grow, especially those high performers. The fourth reason is it shows trust and respect. Those are two very, very powerful elements in leadership. And the fifth reason is in the long run, it becomes way faster. Your team will become way more agile. You get more done, which sounds very counterintuitive, provided you've invested in the front end. All right, fine, fine. I get it, Daryl. We should delegate more, blah, blah, blah. I've heard that all the time. But really, I still have all of these, these reasons not to. Maybe you just don't understand my situation. Well, I hear you. I have a lot of experience in this, both coaching and my own experiences. So let's dive into maybe some of the reasons that you're not able to delegate some of those, those challenges that you're feeling. Maybe they're extrinsic, they're external, or maybe they're intrinsic, things that you maybe feel inside. So one reason is that you don't feel that your team is really up to the task, the team in general or the team members. Maybe that's one reason. So you're thinking, if I give them this this delegation, if I delegate this task off or this project or whatever it might be, I just don't think they're going to be able to do it. That's all there is to it. And it's going to fail epically. And then that is going to look poorly on me. Totally understand that. Maybe you enjoy doing the work yourself. I know for me, for example, I do like elements of the IT part of producing content and working with clients, both one-on-one -on -one and group coaching through various um, you know, multimedia platforms, all of those kinds of things. Heck, my lights are all smart in that they dim and turn different colors all by my voice. Thank you very much to Google. And I won't say the exact thing because it's probably going to dim my lights, but I really enjoy that. And I enjoy things like video editing. I enjoy all of the, the, the meshing of systems on the IT perspective, just as an example with giving my background as an IT project manager. So maybe you're the same way. You actually genuinely enjoy doing the work. So that's another reason you don't delegate. Maybe you like the feeling of being indispensable. Now, contrary to the fact that it's actually unhealthy, ineffective, and impedes the team development, and erodes that respect influence, but maybe delegating will somehow degrade your importance at work and maybe your feeling of, of importance as well. Maybe another reason you don't delegate is because you're a perfectionist. And trust me, I have come across my share of perfectionists. And that is something very, very difficult to handle. A lot of people recognize it, but they have a lot of trouble releasing any of the tasks through delegation because of the perfectionism aspect of it. And it's actually deeper than just work related tasks. A lot of times this really spills over into your personal life as well. So you'll often uh, see a perfectionist in both personal and professional lives. So maybe that's part of the challenge of you delegating as well. So you need to see that email before it gets sent out, or you need to read that project charter. And if you find yourself editing the verbiage rather than the content, and maybe you're wordsmithing an awful lot, I'm not saying that's necessarily um, indicative of you being a perfectionist, but maybe you're not spending the time exactly as you need to. So maybe that's another reason you're just a perfectionist. Maybe you lack self-confidence and don't want to be shown up by your team members. I've seen this quite often as well. The whole idea of being a leader is surround yourself with people smarter and better than you and to develop other leaders. But sometimes deep down, there's this, am I still relevant? Like, I don't want to be upstaged, particularly if you work with some really, really smart people. And so your self-confidence gets a hit every time that somebody can figure something out way faster than you, you name it. So that's another reason you lack the confidence to hand those things off. Maybe you think that Delegation is just too slow or tasks or it just it just takes too long to get it done. You know, if I if I was to do it myself and I totally understand that this is one I personally struggle with a lot. 
you know what, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to explain it and I'm going to have to coach them and it's going to take days or weeks for them to really get it the same way that I would like and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to get it done. And guess what, parents? This is the parent trap. Uh, why our kids maybe don't do laundry. Why it is that they don't do cleaning up or anything like that. Why? Ah, instead of fighting and nagging, I'll just do it myself. It's faster. Totally get it. Parent here. Totally understand that. Another reason that you don't delegate is maybe you're a business owner, entrepreneur, in particular, and you're just used to doing everything yourself. You wouldn't even think to hand certain pieces of work off because that's just what you do. That is part of being an entrepreneur. That's part of being a business owner. That is just part of your career evolution. You've got to your position because you've got stuff done and you've done really well with it. So it doesn't even really kind of um, occur to you to be delegating work off. Like that's my job. Right. And it's not from a negative ownership perspective, but you just actually literally think that, well, that's just part of my job. That's part of my job description. So it's not even a reluctance to hand work off via delegation. And you just simply haven't had to. And you simply haven't all of these years. The final reason is, and again, we can go on and on with all the reasons and, and a lot of them if not all of them are actually deep rooted from a, a very personal or values perspective, but we confuse being busy with being productive and it's either a form of procrastination or it makes us feel more important. Like I mentioned before. So we like being busy because that means if I'm doing the tech stuff, for example, then that's comfortable for me. I like it. I enjoy it. All the things, but deep down, I could be procrastinating from something bigger and more important that will actually move the yardstick, move the needle forward in terms of my leadership and yours as well. And like I said, maybe there is a sense of self-importance that comes with that, but we often get confused with being busy and being productive. So those are a multitude of reasons why we probably don't delegate. And there are certainly a lot more, but that just frames the conversation that we're about to have because we're going to move into pretty quick what we can do about that. How do we actually delegate effectively? Now, before we get into the actual elements to effectively delegate, three caveats. Number one, just because you delegate doesn't mean that you are no longer responsible for that task. Can't stress that enough. Just because you delegate doesn't mean that you are no longer responsible for that task. So guess what? yet another incentive to delegate effectively. People think that, well, I, I hand that work off or that task and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Incorrect. Incorrect. You are still very much in charge. So making sure that when you delegate, it's just not like a fire and forget missile and you never worry about it again. You have to be following up. So that's the first caveat. The second caveat is just because you delegate, it doesn't mean that you no longer have to do any work. You want to delegate to free yourself up to do other work specific tasks and projects for your specific job. Maybe that's conduct one-on-ones, the performance feedback, troubleshoot, think about a plan for the next month or three months, looking down the road in, in terms of where your team is going and maybe career development, all of those other things, all of those strategic pieces that you should be spending time on as a leader. The third caveat is start small. I recognize that we are talking about personal comfort and we don't have to just take the tactics that I'm going to talk about and just boom, you know, apply them all over the place. Pull out like an Oprah Winfrey. Everyone gets delegated tasks. Everybody, everybody. That's not it at all. I recognize that this can be a challenge both in terms of a skill because that's what delegation really is and also that, that comfort level like I talked about. We don't want delegation to actually cause more stress. The whole idea that we're delegating is to cause you less stress, less workload, and moving from that micromanager, even if you feel like you have to, moving from that micromanager to more of that strategic leader. What are the two secrets? They're actually two techniques, but there's some sub tasks or, or techniques, if you will, underneath those. And the first one is use what is called 
leaders in tent. Leaders in tent, not leaders in a tent, but leaders in tent, especially the element around end state. So what is leaders in tent? It involves three elements, a task. Okay. So that's what is to be done. The purpose. So why is it important? Why does it need to get done? And then the third, which is super important, is what is that end state? What does right look like? What does right feel like at the end of this? So that is leader's intent, a task, a purpose, and an end state. So a what, a why, and what does right look like by the end of this task or this project? And what's really great about leader's intent is it can be applied at a macro le level, so like a, more of a strategic view corporately, but also right down to the micro level, right down to an individual task given to an individual team member. So let's maybe give a couple of examples. I'll go way back into the World War, World War II and D-Day in particular. And a lot of us, most of us are familiar with the beach landings and the video and, and uh, all of the movies that have made about that, so on and so forth of, of folks storming the the beaches heroically, totally, totally the bravest souls in the world. There was another part of the operation that involved paratroopers. Paratroopers were soldiers that jumped out of aircraft on parachutes and landed in this context behind enemy lines or behind the beach. Okay, so we have those two, broadly speaking, um, strategic and tactical thrusts. We've got the beach landings of, of landing craft landing and soldiers storming the beaches. And then we had the paratroopers, which was that airborne element behind the enemy lines, broadly speaking. We're familiar with the beach landings, but we may not be as familiar with the paratroop drop. So what ended up happening was, from a tactical perspective, the paratroop drop was an absolute disaster. Lots of movies have been made about that. They didn't have GPSs back then, so they were navigating as best they could. Tremendous pressure, stress, gunfire, all of the things on that particular day and you know, leading up to and, and days after, of course. So by any accounts, tactically speaking, that paratrooper drop failed miserably. And yet, strategically, that whole thrust, that whole part of D-Day, the paratroop drop was a success. And so you ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, one conclusion was maybe it wasn't necessary. Like... If it didn't go so well, maybe it wasn't even worth doing in the first place. Yeah, sure, you could make that argument, but I think the actual truth of the matter is that entire operation utilized leaders' intent, the task and the purpose and the end state in three elements, right down to the platoon, like the individual team level. So think about this from a corporate perspective. Maybe it's a, a project team or it's a business unit or something like that. Obviously not a war context. So how did that play out on D-Day? Well, if I was a leader, I would be going to my team, the platoon, uh, the, a platoon that reported to me. I'm like, hey, team A, I want you to go find a bridge at this grid coordinate, at this geographic location, at this essential address. There's a bridge there. I want you to hold on to it. One of the main reasons is that that bridge... There were a couple other reasons, but one of the reasons was that bridge is really important for us to head inland, right? We got to go fast. Once we, once we get a hold of this beach, we want these bridges intact so that we can head inland. So the bridge is at this address. The why is we need those to move inland. And then the end state is as many bridges as possible intact, including the one that you're working on. So essentially what? Seize a bridge. Here's why. We need those bridges to move inland. Three, what is the end state? What does right look like? Your bridge intact and as many bridges as possible intact across the countryside. All right, perfect. So I have that same conversation as a leader to team B. I just change the location of the bridge. That's all. But the why is still the same. We need those bridges intact to move inland. Perfect. All right, so the end state is that bridge intact and as many bridges intact as possible. And this conversation is going on throughout a whole bunch of teams in the paratroopers. And again, there's a few other reasons why they'd want to seize the bridges. But just for example, what ended up happening? So if 
I am soldier A and I jump out of the aircraft and I end up uh, landing in a location that I'm not familiar with because there were no GPSs and all sorts of, of challenges. Guess what I did? I would go look for a bridge. Is it the bridge I was assigned? No, probably wasn't, but that's okay. Because meanwhile, soldier B, soldier C, dropping out of these aircraft and landing, they are all doing the exact same thing. They are finding a bridge and they are seizing it because their original task is out like at this address, this bridge, I don't know where it is, but the why, right? we need those bridges intact. And the end state is as many bridges intact as possible. Hmm, that makes sense to me. So what am I going to do? I am going to go find a bridge and I'm gonna hold on to it. And as I'm walking along, I'm soldier B, I come across soldier C. Hey, what's going on? Not much, this, uh, this didn't go so well, but let's go find a bridge and let's hold on to it. And meanwhile, all of that activity was happening, that decentralized activity was happening across the countryside so that enough soldiers acted independently in a decentralized way to go find a bridge and hold on to it. From a corporate perspective, just think about it. If you're implementing an IT system, for example, and you're saying that, look, by the end of the implementation, maybe you assign a date to it, but we need a system that performs X function, Y function, and Z function. Okay, so that is the end state. So the task is to develop a system uh, ordering system. Here's why we're really inefficient. So we need to drive efficiencies, drive down costs, uh, simplify administration. And at the end of this whole implementation cycle or this project, we need a system that performs X, Y, and Z. Another example comes from my own experience as a project manager, I was handed this rather significant project that our competitor in this industry, in the telecommunications industry, was getting hardware out, devices out far faster than we were able to. So as a result, if I'm a customer and I, I call in and I ask for a particular service, well, guess what? I'm going to go with the company that can provide me that service the quickest. And part of that provision of the service is getting hardware out to the resident. So if I'm looking at company A, and I, I can be up and running in 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, that's awesome. I contact company B, company I worked for, and company B wasn't able to get the client or the customer or the resident up and running for at least four days, which included the hardware delivery. No, you're going to lose a lot of customers. So as a result, I did a current state analysis on it along with a bunch of other people. I'm I was just a project manager. That's all I was. But essentially what was the end state was to beat our competitor, provide services, including the hardware, either at the same rate as our competitor or better. So that was our end state. And then we just worked backwards from that. So everything that we were doing everywhere in that project was based on that timeline, based on that end state. So if I'm a programmer, or if I'm in marketing or I'm in client services, whatever it might be, that is what right looks like. And, and so I'm making decisions based on that end state without having to go back to me as a project manager, for example, or a VP or something like that. You're making these decisions independently while still moving ahead and really uh, leveraging the expertise of the individuals uh, working with you. So that is leader's intent, involves that task, that purpose, and the end state. So if you're going to delegate, give that intent, okay? Give that leader's intent. So that is one way to de delegate effectively. So first step is give your intent, give that task, that purpose. The second secret, it actually builds on the first one very, very well. So remember, if you really wanna turbocharge that delegation, you're going to use what I call the DDB leadership expectations agreement. Let's say you're a VP and you're talking to a project manager. Okay. So you're a project sponsor and you're having a conversation with the project manager that's been designated. Maybe you've chosen them, whatever the case is. So the first step in the expectations agreement is to give your intent, give that task purpose in the end state, the what, the why, and the end state. That's the first step. 
The second step is they seek clarity through questions. So the project manager in this example, they are asking you questions and you're answering as best you can so that that project manager has understanding. So the whole idea of this second step is for that individual or that team for that matter to gain understanding. The third step is to ask that project manager, what support do you need from me? Critical part of leadership is providing support for folks. It's not awesome to just dump a whole project or a bunch of tasks on somebody and say, Hey, see ya. Let me know how it goes and don't screw it up. No, our job as leaders is not to be command and control types, but really to support. So that's the third step is you ask them, what support do you need from me? The fourth step is they express their needs. They're open about it. A lot of times there's a reluctance for project managers or individuals say, oh, no, you know what? I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. I'll, I got this because they don't want to show weakness, for example. But no, part of the agreement, part of the process, the leadership expectations agreement is to express those needs. And, and if I'm the VP, to be open to what those needs are and don't like slam the door on them. Let them express those needs. And then you compromise as if you need to. So then you say, hey, you know what, uh, that's fine. I can give you uh, a couple extra team members or, you know, I'll talk to another VP and grab them from another business area or something, but I cannot give you more time, for example. So there's that bit of a give and a take. Remember, this is an agreement. The last step of the DDB leadership expectations framework is to restate and summarize. All right. So we've talked about this. Here's my intent. We've answered some of the questions here. I just want to make sure there's no other questions you have around that. Okay, awesome. Uh, looks like this is the support uh, you need from me, and this is what I'm able to provide you. And uh, really, I think we're good to go. You need to figure out what you're going to be doing as far as an update you know, schedule and things like that. But the leadership expectations agreement is the dialogue. So you have that leader's intent, the task, purpose, and end state. Sometimes that's good enough, but if you really want to turbocharge it, you implement the DDB leadership expectations agreement to really hone in on what is required. And I would suspect or suggest even that you as the VP or the project manager puts it into an email or whatever that looks like, but really to articulate what that agreement was. And it's not a formal document necessarily. Well, I suppose you could, but it's really about a mutual understanding and it's a mutual agreement that this is what we're looking at here. And this is what we've agreed upon so that we can hold each other accountable to the progress and the result of this particular project. So those are all sorts of reasons for, for why delegation is important, why we don't, and two secrets, two tactics, two techniques, two concepts that will allow you to delegate more effectively. So please start small, but remember, you're still responsible for this whole thing. You're still the captain of the ship. Just because there are crew members doing all sorts of different activities doesn't mean that you're going to be sitting in the bridge with your feet up. This now should free you up to do more strategic tasks. It should be allowing you to troubleshoot. And also selfishly, it's developing your team so that you actually don't have to micromanage them anymore. So your sense of overwhelm and stress and all of the things will drop dramatically. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a comment, share, like, all of the things. I would appreciate it.